Welcome, folks. Welcome, welcome. My name is Andrew Jones. I'm the co the co-founder and executive director of Climate Interactive. We're thrilled you're here for the webinar. You are on time. And we're going to wait a few minutes for others to join. But while we all gather, please go to the poll and let us know where you are in the world. You'll see a map, drop a pin. We'd love to see where you are. How you get there is you go to poll everywhere. You can see a, a link at the top, open another browser window. Or Ava, would you post that into chat? This, of course, is going to be a really special and exciting version of our monthly webinar. We're featuring our friends from Probable Futures, Spencer Glendon, Peter Croce, who are going to introduce this mind-blowingly cool set of maps that are going to show us impacts of climate change at different temperatures around the world. And we're going to take a shot at connecting En-ROADS, our tool, to probable futures as we tell a story about where things could be headed. But right now, what you're doing, if you're joining us, you're going to poll everywhere and letting us know you're in New England, or I think that's the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, some Texas, some Pacific Northwest. I'm going to Scandinavia. I'm, I just don't want to fail with my European ge geography. Anybody? Spencer, can you see what those are? Specifically, we've got a Denmark and a Sweden. Denmark and a Sweden. Great. And a lot of US, some Florida, Mexico, Colombia, Brazil. Fantastic. Yeah. Help with the geography. Anybody who it's, sees it. Somebody uh, is north of, somebody is north of Alaska. Wow. Beirut. Welcome. <laughs> we, much of our infrastructure was built by people in Beirut. Uh, many of our engineers are in are, are really awesome teammates uh, that Peter works with closely. We all work with, but uh, Peter works with closely right. in Beirut. And what time is it in Australia? Oh, they just we just lost the Australia guy. <laughs> Welcome, folks. If you're just joining, my name is Andrew Jones with Climate Interactive, and I've got a big team of Climate Interactive folks as well as our partners and friends at Probable Futures. This is gonna be a special version of the webinar that's gonna focus on mapping the impacts of climate change with Probable Futures. We're really curious where you are. Actually, let's just go on while we welcome other people to the next poll question, which is really, it's gonna be helpful for us to know how much you've seen En-ROADS. What's your past experience? Is this the first time? And you just seen it, which means we should probably do a little bit more of an intro, or maybe you just have participated in a workshop or a game or seen a demo. Actually, have you see shown it to someone else, led an event, or are you one of the 658 En-ROADS climate ambassadors who's gone through the training program and all that certification, and you are uh, answering D. And right now, not a lot of first timers, a lot of people who've seen it and uh, either played with it or you are a full ambassador. Great to know that there's the mix of folks. We move kind of quickly. I'm going on to the next poll. Same question with probable futures. Is this the first time you will have seen probable futures? Uh, and it's this, well, you would know it if the name if you've seen it before or have you played with it briefly, saw it in a presentation? Have you actually gone through the lessons and explored the maps? Have you actually used it to inform a decision? Few people at the more deep level, but most people, as we guessed, uh, for the first time. If so, you are in the right place because this is going to be, really for many of us, even at Climate Interactive, a good introduction to probable futures. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing those polls, and it's five minutes past, so let's just talk a little bit about the, the motivation. Why are we here? People come, you've heard about En-ROADS, maybe you saw the title of this, and the spark for me about why I really am thrilled that Spencer and, and Peter are here really is this list of summer headlines that I've been watching 
through the summer. And notice, you're going to see my United States perspective. I'm just notice what's been happening here. The hottest June and then July on Earth in over 100,000 years. Canadian wildfires in the way that had blown around the whole northern part of the United States. Vermont flooded, friends and family up there. Phoenix had 31 consecutive days with temperatures over 110 degrees. Florida oceans, hot, basically is bath water. The Maui wildfires, Hillary, this tropical storm hitting uh, LA area. So this is when we look directly at what's in front of our face. And to really respond to what is going on here, we want to take a bigger perspective, step back and say, where are things likely headed given the best available science and modeling? And in the world, I love the maps that have come in the studies by the general circulation models and the CMIP suite of models, but I can't understand them. I look at the papers and I can't. What I can understand is what these guys have built at Probable Futures. Go there right now if you're a multitasker. Probable Futures. Maybe someone could just drop it in chat because what they have is a whole way to think about it with the kind of context and then these incredible maps. But I'm not going to steal the thunder. They're going to show you what those things are. So this exercise today is inviting our friends as the special guest stars, but then to see, can we take our mitigation focused tool and roads that I'll show in a minute and connect it to these maps? That's what we're going to be doing together. So because some of you have never seen En-ROADS, I'm going to do the quickest introduction to En-ROADS that has ever been done on planet Earth. Well, there's a 1.6 degree scenario that I made earlier. That's not what we're looking at. So this is En-ROADS. It is available in 21 languages. It is available free for use. Ava, can you just drop a link so anyone can play with it? And what it allows you to do is very quickly understand the impact of various interventions down at the bottom, like energy efficiency in buildings and industry or transport or more renewable energy or cutting methane, and then see what does it do to the energy mix, methane emissions, other emissions, overall greenhouse gas emissions, and then temperature. And a little bit about what that temperature means in the world. We have been blown away by how much people love seeing the implications on maps. We have one map, sea level rise. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we want to understand uh, much more with other maps. And so that's why we are here working with uh, Probable Futures to see how could their work supplement what you can do here, where you're able to map the impacts of various actions in the world. Ava, would you drop the um, the welcome and the, the link to our Mastering En-ROADS course? If you'd like to learn more about using that tool, the best way is to go there or to go to some of our other videos to learn how to use this tool in a workshop format. But today, we're going to shift pretty quickly to learning about probable futures. And then I'm going to ask you to make a scenario here that will connect to theirs. Okay, so I'm going to send it over to one of the founders of Probable Futures. No, actually, this is going to go first to Peter. Peter Croce, you get to introduce this tool, show us what it's about, and uh, give us some context for how we should even think about climate stability. Great. Thanks, Drew. All right, I'm going to share here. 100%. All right. So, hey, everyone. I am Peter Croce. Am I getting a thumbs up? You can see this. That's great. <laughs> I'm Peter Croce, and I'm product lead at Probable Futures, which means I get to work with some incredibly talented people to make some of the things that you will see today. And first today, I want to share some context for climate change. So we know that the world is changing, right? And if you've used En-ROADS before, or if you're here and you've heard about it, you know that it shows different warming scenarios based on changes to factors that affect the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And after seeing scenarios like these, it's natural to have questions. In fact, I have in the past when I've used En-ROADS, 
I wondered, what will climate change really mean for me and my communities and the people and places I depend on? In practical terms, how will I live in a changing world and what will be different? How might we live well? So at Probable Futures, we saw a way to offer answers to these questions. We're talking useful maps of weather patterns in different probable scenarios covering the whole world right down to the local level. So Probable Futures is a nonprofit climate literacy initiative making practical tools and educational resources available online to everyone everywhere. And we really mean everyone. We work with communities and governments, businesses and individuals, because we all need to prepare for the climate changes that we're experiencing now, right? The futures that are likely and coming soon and work to avoid the ones that carry the most profound risks. So our goals at Probable Futures are to democratize climate science or make it widely available for people to use and to build societal climate literacy. So we're gonna to start today with a question that might seem like kind of a funny question at first. Why did it take so long for us to begin burning fossil fuels in the first place? And it did take a long time. People like you and I have been around for about 200,000 years, but it wasn't until about 12,000 years ago that we had the first known human settlements. And curiously, these all emerged in different places on different continents all around the world, seemingly disconnected. And it wasn't until several thousand years later that the first known libraries emerged, which began to enable specialized knowledge to accumulate over generations. And in the 1800s, we began to see the kind of career specialization that underpins modern life today and enables our civilization to do things like extract, refine, and burn fossil fuels for the many things we use it and all of the other things that we do that are specialized in our civilization. So we know that these communities started to settle around 12,000 years ago, but for much of history, we didn't really know why they settled, when they did, and all at once in this, in this disconnected way. But what we did know was that these communities enabled cultures and that cultures enabled formal governments, which began to build infrastructure from roads and bridges to laws and policies, which enabled industry, until eventually we had this incredibly complex civilization with lots of specializations like finance and investing and social services and burning of fossil fuels for energy. So why didn't humans settle before 9,000 BCE, about 12,000 years ago? Well, interestingly, the specialization of climate science helped scientists and anthropologists find the answer. So here we're looking at a graph of the history of global average temperature on Earth. And the way that you can read this is, the closer the line is to zero, this line here, the closer the global average temperature was to before the climate started to change in the 1800s. And so you can see it's very close here to that line and it wavers a lot more down here. And so we can think about what people were doing at different times on this graph. And we know that our earliest ancestors emerged from Africa around 200,000 years ago. And for about 180,000 years, they were nomadic living by hunting and gathering. And then about 12,000 years ago, communities all around the world settled and started agriculture. And looking at this chart, we can get a sense for why. Because around that time, the climate stabilized. And before that, the, for this 180,000 years that people were around, it fluctuated a lot, changing dramatically. And a changing climate like that in this blue area here of that magnitude of changes was just not conducive for settling in one place. But a stable climate in, in this green area was. So now we know that a stable climate was actually the foundation for all of these layers of civilization that we've built up over the last 12,000 years. Communities and cultures, government, infrastructure, and industry, and all the specializations that are enabled on top of that. And it turns out that the global average temperature or the climate of the last 12,000 years was actually perfect for people. So there were these large expanses of temperate land, stable seasonal patterns, and nowhere was too hot for the human body. 
So what do we mean when we say too hot for the human body? Well, for that, we need to learn about wet bulb temperature. Many people haven't heard about wet bulb temperature because the climate hasn't been too hot for the human body, so they haven't needed to, to know about it. But it's a measure of heat and humidity. And as the climate warms, you'll be hearing more about it because warmer air holds more water. So you get heat and you also get humidity at the same time. And this matters because we're large, warm-blooded mammals and we need to give off heat. And if the air around us isn't cool enough to cool down our bodies, then our bodies need to sweat. But our bodies can only give off heat with sweat if the air around us is dry enough to evaporate our sweat. So as you can see on this chart, with extreme danger and death, there are some very extreme wet bulb temperatures that can be very dangerous for people. And when you think about this, you can see that there's also combinations of heat and humidity. So you have the number that you say, like 32 degrees C wet bulb, um, but you can achieve that with different combinations of humidity um, and heat. For simplicity, if you think of something like 32 degrees C wet bulb, you can think of it as 32 degrees C and 100% humidity. So let's actually look at some maps of this now. So this is a probable futures map, and we'll be looking at more of these today. And this probable futures map in particular is showing the number of days above 32 degrees C. And you can always find the name of the map on the top left here. So 32 degrees C, wet bulb temperature. Um, we're looking at the places all around the world um, in the past. So all of probable futures maps are oriented around these warming scenarios. And you can see that 0.5 degrees C is selected here with this purple selection. And 0.5 degrees C happened between 1970 and 2000. So if you've used En-ROADS before, you may be familiar with scenarios like this because you put in inputs and it gives you, it produces scenarios and our tools can tell you what those scenarios mean. So if you use En-ROADS and you change all of the different inputs and you get a two degrees scenario, you can look at these maps to see what would the world actually be like in that scenario. So each of these probable futures maps begins with the past climate scenario, this 0.5 degrees C. And that way we can understand what the climate that we're used to and the climate that everything was built for was actually like. And so the world now, the amount of warming we're experiencing now has warmed by 1.2 degrees C. And so we're somewhere between one and 1.5 now in terms of the warming that we're experiencing now. Um, and so we can look between these two scenarios to understand what the world would be like there. So now I wanna go back to this, this chart. And if we go back even further in history, we can see that a stable climate is actually not guaranteed. The earth has been much hotter than it has been during human existence. If you look all the way back here on the left, this is really, really hot back here compared to what we have experienced as humans so far. And it was so hot back here, in fact, that only species like dinosaurs and insects and very small mammals could live above water. So it's a very different world from what we've experienced. But if we direct our attention now to the right side of the graph, we can see that the temperature today is now beginning to break out of that human civilization temperature band. And if we continue emitting on the same trajectory that we are now, this orange part here, we will break out of the human existence temperature band by the end of the century. And so that graph helps us see that climate change isn't just about warmer temperatures, but about losing stability. Because the foundation of a stable climate is deteriorating. And that's a problem because today, every aspect of our society makes assumptions that climate stability at the level that it has been will continue. And so these are some obvious examples of um, ways that we assume climate stability. Maybe you could think of some others. City storm sewers are designed for certain amounts of precipitation. Power systems were meant to withstand certain max uh, load factors or temperatures. Residences in many places are meant to keep heat in rather than keep it out. Schools have summer vacation and seasonal sports. And all agriculture is dependent on steady precipitation, whether it has irrigation or not, because uh, there needs to be water nearby to run that irrigation. So every community sector and industry has assumed climate stability in different ways. 
But if you're here today, if you chose to attend this webinar, you probably already know uh, a lot of this stuff, and you know that climate ad adaptation and mitigation are important. So what this shows us now is that they're actually also interrelated. So if we don't have strong ways of coordinating like communities and cultures and governments, infrastructure and industry, and if we're dealing with the climate crisis, it's better to reduce emissions in the time frame in which we need to do it. So adaptation is stabilizing a stack with all these lines here and mitigation is preventing the foundation from deteriorating any further. And by using these maps and developing a keen awareness of our climate, we can get the context that we need to both manage the unavoidable impacts of climate change and avoid the unmanageable ones. So let's look at a little bit at how we do that. So we're gonna go back to the maps. And again, this is the map of 32 degrees C wet bulb in a past climate. So 0.5 degrees C is selected there. And we remember that, we remember that 32 degrees C um, wet bulb means 32 degrees C or 90 degrees Fahrenheit and 100% humidity. So it's very extreme. And you can see that this temperature in a past climate basically never happened anywhere. So if you look at the key on the bottom left, you can see that gray is zero and basically the whole world here is zero. And now as I move through these scenarios, I'm gonna move through one and 1.5 and two, 2.5 and three after this, keep your eye on the Middle East around the Red Sea and around the Bay of Bengal and in India and Bangladesh. So we move to one, 1.5, begin to see some color, two, 2.5, and three. We can begin to see that this thing that never happened in a past climate is now happening in some different places around the world. And we're gonna zoom in on these maps because you can zoom in and let's look at some of these places. So let's look at Calcutta first, where over 14 million people live. And we can click on these maps too. That's another thing you can do. Um, and we're gonna click on Calcutta and see that in a past climate, we have 0.5 degrees C selected here. We can see that in an average year, this middle number, this never happened, but also in a warm year, this never happened. This right side here, this shows you what it would be like in a warm year in this particular scenario, never happened. Uh, and in a cool year, of course, it, it also never happened. So uh, this is something that just never happened in Calcutta in the past. But if we move to one degree C, we can see that now it's beginning to happen. And so people have experienced this now already. Uh, one degrees uh, or, or one uh, day is now, now experiencing this 32 degrees C wet bulb condition um, and in a warm year for four days. But if we move now to 1.5, we can see that in a warm year, almost a week, uh, of these days. Now two degrees C, almost two weeks in a warm year and in a typical year or an average year, it's happening every year. At 2.5 now, in a warm year, almost a month, and in a, a typical year or an average year for about a week, three degrees C. Now in a warm year, it's over two, it's over, it's almost two months. It's a, a month and a half and almost two weeks in an average year. So now this is a very different place than it was before. These are conditions that never, never happened before. Let's go look at another place. Well, let's look at the Red Sea around the Middle East, another place that we looked at before on those global maps. And we're looking here because there are large populations in the Middle East that live around the Red Sea. Um, and we've focused in particular on Dubai uh, because it's a place that's known for being very hot and humid, but it's also a place that we think of as people generally having figured out how to live with heat. But if we notice on this past map of 32 degrees C wet bulb, this actually didn't happen in an average year in Dubai, but it happened once in a warm year in the past. Um, and so even this place that's very hot and humid, this condition didn't really happen in the past, and not very often at all. So if we begin to move through these scenarios, we can see that it becomes more common at one, at 1.5 now, in a warm year, it's almost two weeks. At two, now it's over two weeks in a warm year and in an average year, about four days. At 2.5, it's almost a month now in a warm year and in an average year for a week, they're experiencing this. And at three degrees C, now we, are, we have it for over a month 
in, in a warm year and in an average year for you know, over a week, almost two weeks. And so these are very, very different places. But now we can think about how can we imagine how to live in these places? We actually have these maps and we can see what it will be like to live in these different places in a changing climate. And that's, it's very different from what we usually think about of the future, right? And these narratives that we often hear, uh, because we often hear we'll have continued stability, but with electric cars and climate change is solved and the world is basically the same, but with electric cars and one where there's perpetual apocalypse. There are all kinds of movies with apocalypse of the future, um, but we know that number one is no longer possible. We're already experiencing change and we can see with these maps that the near-term future is going to be quite different than the past. So it's not gonna be the same, but with electric cars. And number two is avoidable in a ways off. We're not going to go to apocalypse all of a sudden and we can still work to avoid the more extreme levels of warming. So what we need to do now is populate those probable futures in between. What do those look like? And we can use these maps to frame what's possible and realistic in a warming world. We can guide our preparation and our adaptation with these maps and prepare accordingly. So what can you do? So you can explore with your communities. What are our climate risks? Locally in the communities where you live or the people that you depend on around the world, what are the climate risks there? How are you preparing for the nearer term warming scenarios, the ones that we know we need to prepare for? What kinds of things are you doing? Are you thinking about the infrastructure? Are you thinking about the different people and places that you depend on and all the things that they depend on of different patterns, seasons? And are our climate leaders literate? Are they, are they climate literate? Are they thinking about the kinds of things that uh, they need to be thinking about to prepare uh, for this climate future? So this is what we call climate awareness. And with it, we can see that life in a changing climate is going to be different, but different in what ways? Now that's up to us. And for the first time in human history, thanks to climate science and these kinds of things that we're seeing, we actually know a lot about the future. We've never been able to know about the future before. And so that means we can imagine ways to live well in a changing climate. And we have the opportunity to design the futures that we want to live in and think ahead and make changes so that we can reduce emissions to avoid the most disruptive futures and be ready to live well in the futures that we know are coming. So that's all from me. I'll hand it back to Drew. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. And thank you all for like, what an amazing tool. This is so fantastic. And the offer to everyone here today, let's put the two together. We have the tool of En-ROADS that focuses on what can be done to reduce future temperature primarily. And now we have this visualization tool to see what happens in a wide range of scenarios. So think of this as an experiment. This is the first time we're doing this, but it's also an offer. Could you imagine doing this with leaders whomever you could engage. And it would be to ask the big several questions. And the first question will be, what can be done to prevent future warming? And then secondly, what is it going to look like? And I have particularly two questions that we're going to want to get into. What does 2030, seven years from now, look like no matter what? And how much better does it look out further in the century if we do all we can to prevent warming? Those are the two questions that I'm going to send over to Spencer uh, as we kind of do this baton handoff between our two tools. So I'm going to start. Here we go with what can be done in to prevent all that we can prevent. And let's make a scenario. What do you think ought to be done to prevent climate change? You get to choose up to five things. Thorium, fission, and carbon price, and coal, and oil, and food systems. These are uh, maybe 10 of the 50 or so things you can change in En-ROADS. So live into your vision of a world going for it, of preventing as much warming 
in the future as possible. Uh, carbon prices winning, coal, renewables, discouraging oil, food, energy efficiency and transport. Nobody wants fusion. People want other things. Carbon price is getting the most votes. Fantastic. I think I get the idea. All right. I'm going to go over and let's implement many of these. What was at the top were, uh, well, let's now note, if you like this exercise and you thought you were coming to learn about En-ROADS, there are many other trainings that do this much more slowly, breaking down the impact of each of the things I'm about to do, because there's a lot more nuance than what I'm about to show. Oh, and by the way, if you have questions of Peter's presentation, of what I'm doing right now, of En-ROADS, of where you can get it, the best place to go is in Zoom, Q&A. Look in Zoom, Q&A, pop that up. Some will answer verbally. Some will answer by typing. Some will send you to the support page. And at the top of the hour, when we end this, we're actually going to stay on and answer more of your questions. So, But do type them into Q&A. Okay, all the things that we just heard about, let's go put them together. What if in this world where we already have the baseline future you see, and I, I should show you a little bit more before I start clicking sliders and making things better. In this world where we have coal, you can see in brown here in this graph, we have from 2000 to 2100, this wedge of brown is coal, staying pretty flat, oil pretty flat, a little growth in natural gas, wind and solar in green expanding and getting more and more of it, because it's so inexpensive and it's being picked up and subsidized and promoted all around the world, bioenergy in pink, nuclear up top. If that's where we get our energy and it produces the carbon dioxide from those energy sources and carbon dioxide from land use, from deforestation, land degradation, et cetera, and methane and the F gases and nitrous oxide and fertilizer, et cetera, those are all of the greenhouse gases that you can see here. The pollution that is causing global warming. If we followed the pledges of the Paris Agreement, we would go through that red dot. If we got to net zero, this line would go all the way down to zero here, and that temperature would go down well below two degrees. So let's put together what you just proposed. Watch how things change with a low carbon price and a high carbon price and a very high carbon price with renewable energy with energy efficiency and transport and electric vehicles and heat pumps and insulation and other actions there, less deforestation and degradation, cutting methane and other gases and fertilizer and waste and landfills and cattle, food waste, et cetera. Uh, maybe we'll grow a few trees, but probably not a whole lot. Um, because of land constraints. And how about some carbon removal where we have low till agriculture out here in the carbon removal area. And we have that. And now we get down to a scenario of 1.6, maybe slightly higher carbon price or a little bit less methane. What does it take to get all the way to 1.5? It is so hard in 2023 to get down to actually, but I, I'm gonna push it and see what would it actually take to get all the way down to 1.5. It, whoa, that's weird. I did something weird in the world of methane, et cetera. Uh, boy, I don't like that one. Uh, well, we have a little bit of odd noise there that we're gonna have to look at. All right, here's a 1.6 degree scenario. What did we do? It took many seeds to plant this garden, many actions all across the board. But the question is, what do we get with temperature? And can we take that temperature scenario and look at it and then imagine what it might do in the probable futures impacts world? Spencer will pick this up and carry it forward. A couple things to note about it. Uh, you heard what I asked before. You can imagine creating this scenario and then asking the two questions. 2030, here's 2030. And I want you to notice that 2030 is the same 
under the scenario where we prevent a lot of climate change as it is in the scenario where we don't. So in both cases, it is about 1.5 in seven years. So when I asked Spencer, tell us what the world would look like somewhere in 2030, he's gonna go see, and it doesn't really matter how much we prevent climate change when it comes to this temperature. However, look out at the end of the century and notice the big difference between around three and around 1.5. So that's the second question. Can you help us see how much better it would be if we were to do all we can do to prevent this problem? And I wanna ask it pretty specifically, what are you curious about? So if you would go to the poll and when we're gonna go look at a place and he's gonna show us 2030 and he's gonna show us the end of the century, what do you care about? Wildfires, temperature, drought, precipitation? Vote, vote, vote. We're really curious to see what you would like to learn about uh, because probable future has many and many maps in these four areas uh, and other areas actually as well. So Spencer, you see what you're seeing. It's a tight race up oh, drought, just pushed out wildfires. Drought, drought, we got drought now. Drought is winning. Uh, oh, it's so tight. Well, you get a choice now, Spencer. All right. Actually, which do you like, Spencer? Let's do drought and we can move to wildfire from drought. They are intimately related. Great, okay. Then the second question is, uh, where would you like to look at drought? And answer in one word, if you have two words like Las Vegas, you've got to put a hyphen between them uh, for it to show up in this word cloud. If you see a word you like, type it exactly as that. Like Africa, California, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, and it'll get bigger. And this is how we're voting for this one. Virginia, Hawaii, California. So Spencer, the things are moving around, but uh, this is your cue in a minute. It looks like, boy, people are thinking about California. All right. <laughs> yeah, California keeps winning. All right. So... There's the setup. And imagine you are, my friends, engaging somebody. You've taken it this far. You happen to have this spark of drought in California. How might you, if I pass the baton on to Spencer, take it away, Spencer? All right. Well, thanks, everybody. It is a treat to be here. And what I've done just to get you oriented so you can know how to use it is I'm just going to start at the homepage of Probable Futures. So this is what you get at the homepage. And then up in the right, We've got the index. Peter, can you give me a thumbs up if I'm if I'm if it's doing the right thing? All right. And so we've got a menu here. We can learn about the different sections: stability, risk, and complexity. They go along with each volume. There's a heat volume, a water volume, a land volume, and each one of them has maps. So the maps of dryness, people voted for drought and wildfire are both maps of dryness. So I click on maps of dryness and the first map that comes up is actually the, what's called the change in water balance. So this is how much, what's the net change in total precipitation and, and evapotranspiration. And you can see this around the world. And you wanted to see this, you wanted to look at California. So move the map over, I zoom in, I zoom in. And we won't zoom in too far because we're gonna talk a little bit about California as an interesting place. What you see is that between 0.5 and one, there's not a really big change in total annual water balance, but that's not what you asked about. You asked for a map of drought. And so let's first look at the likelihood of a year plus drought. Actually, let's go all the way to extreme drought. What is the likelihood of an extreme drought? And in the way Peter described, so as these are defined up here, you have the scenarios. 0.5 is the past. That's 1971 to 2000, to so the late 20th century. Recent is one, one degree C. And then just as Drew said, 1.5 is coming. It's impending around 2030, regardless of what we do. So these are scenarios we need to consider. But I'm going to go back first to 0.5, because this is where the definition of a drought is determined. So drought is not the same 
in Carson City, Nevada, in Carson City, Nevada, or Sacramento, even as it is in some part of Oregon or in some part of uh, Texas, for example, drought is locally defined. So people, infrastructure, uh, all the species of plants and animals that are naturally there and all agriculture are tailored to a local climate that was uh, very specific. And so extreme drought is defined here as a one in 20 chance, a, 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 a drought event, a year long drought event that would happen once in a generation, roughly at a 5% chance. And so everywhere on this map, it's 5% or roughly right around 5%. So what happened to the probability of drought when we went from 0.5 to one? Well, the probability of extreme drought went up a lot. I happened to choose a random spot here and it went from five to a 13% chance. That's a big change. That's the difference between ha something happening less than every decade as opposed to every 20 years. And you can see that this is a wide swath. Drought is a problem throughout this whole area. And if we go up to one degree C, you see this change intensifies. And actually drought in California is much more, is goes up in probability in a lot of these places, but it's actually much more severe further down. And so one of the things we've done at Probable Futures is actually not draw the political boundaries on these maps because these climates run together and these cultures run together. And so I'm gonna cheat a little bit and show you a bit more of Mexico, which actually suffers much more from drought than California does. So then we can say, well, okay, we're going to go into California and say, what is relevant for Reno, Nevada or Carson City? Well, we said California. So we'll go to Sacramento. Sacramento, we see this is the capital of California. And you can keep zooming in. You see these boxes are 22 kilometers on a side. And the probability of drought has gone from five here to nine, to nine. But what if it got up to three degrees C? Well, at three degrees C, this would be a huge change. So we're talking about what is the incentive to decrease carbon emissions, to stay at a lower level of warming? The difference between one degree C and three degrees, one and a half and three degrees is huge. It's big for Sacramento, but for this whole region, it's enormous. And if you look down into Mexico, down into the further in the Southwest, the idea that these problems that would be here would be quite severe, wouldn't be partly California problems is probably naive. Now, a corollary to this, we can stay in the same domain, maps of dryness, is look at the change in wildfire danger days. So what happened to them at three degrees C? And what you see is a huge increase in the number of days where it's likely to be a wildfire. Now, this is not a prediction that there will be wildfires, but it's the combination of wetness, then dryness and heat in sequence that makes a wildfire much more likely, the kinds of weather that makes wildfire more likely and what you can see is a huge extension of the wildfire season across these time frames, And this is all versus a baseline. So there was already a reasonably high wildfire risk, but these are additional risks. So now I'm going to look at the chat and Q&A and see if there are other questions people have. What's the cell size? So it's 22 kilometers on a side. So these are about the, you know, they're, they're, they're clear, uh, clear, clearly bigger than your address. You can type in your address. If you want to pick a place, you can go here and put in a particular location. So here are places that I've searched in the past, but you can even just put in an address or a zip code, any geolocation, and it will go there. And part of the reason we don't go further down to a, to a tighter scope is that the climate doesn't exist. There are local climates, as someone accurately asked, Climates are different in Sacramento than here. There are these changes because of the mountains, but 22 kilometers on a side is about the right size for a local climate zone. And so that's the way this works. Drew, where do you think we should go from here? Well, I, where I think we should go would be to boil down like it to a speech that you might give to the mayor of Sacramento who is asking yep. you two questions. And I think you did this, but it went bad quickly. I saw a number 14, uh, but I'd love to see what you're going to say, dear uh, mayor, sure. here's what right. you should be ready for when it comes to uh, drought in Sacramento in 2030. And if you contribute to the global effort to prevent this problem, here's the difference between the end of the century 
between the business as usual three and 1.5. So what's 2030? And then what is the benefit of preventing warming for that grid? How would you boil it down? Because you had some numbers there that uh, I missed because they went by. Sure. So if I were, so this is actually work that Probable Futures does, which is we work with uh, government officials, work with uh, governors, mayors to help them prepare and understand these scenarios. And so in Sacramento, part of what I would say is, okay, the, the probability of drought in Sacramento has gone up some, but drought isn't the primary concern for Sacramento locally. Sacramento, but what's interesting is this whole region that Sacramento is at the heart of is a huge vegetable growing region. It is where roughly half of America's fruits and vegetables come from. And you say, well, drought should be relevant for that. Sort of. Actually, what drives most, most of that productivity is snowfall in these mountains. Yeah. And so, in fact, the nature of the precipitation matters more for how the agricultural region around Sacramento functions than even the quantity. And so there, what we might do is actually go to decreasing cold and say, how much, what, what happens to the number of frost nights or freezing days up in these mountains? Because Sacramento is below these mountains. And what you see is Sacramento in the past basically never froze, but you had freezing all up in here. And this is where that, you can see the ridges of the mountains and you can see these rivers come down. They provide the irrigation for all of the planting that's down here. Yeah. We would say you face a modest risk from increasing drought, but you face a big risk of less snow in these mountains, probably more rain and less snow, but also much more irregular snow melt. And if it gets much warmer, that snow melt that used to be very regular to irrigate all of these places, because this is a huge river delta here, that regularity is going away. And so that's a really big issue. And, and so the third thing I'd say- what you're seeing in the map that says the regularity is going away, like it's sure. green, that means one to seven. So here, so this is, let's go up here. These are places where there's a lot of, so this is the number of days where it stayed below freezing. In fact, it's even, even higher up in here. So in a place like this, just outside of, uh, uh, not it's at the edge of Nevada and, and California, yeah. in this place, in an average year, there were 50 days where the temperature stayed below zero all day. Yep. And in a warm year, there were only 17, while in a cold year, there were 89. So every year, there were at least uh, two and a half weeks or so when it was stayed below freezing all day. So that snowpack yep. hardened, it firmed up. And there might have been as much as three months where it was below freezing. So those are days where you really accumulate that snow, nothing melts. But look what happens when we go from 0.5 to one is those numbers go down. So wow. go back to show you from 50 goes down to 44, from 89 yep. goes down to 82. At one and a half degrees C, well now we've lost more than two weeks here and about two weeks here in the average year, it's fewer days where it's that cold. And so those are days where during the day that snow melts. Got and it. that brings and so you, and if you pair this with one more thing, we'll pick the same cell. Remember where this cell is. We'll look at days above 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 32 degrees C in this same place. So that was this cell at 0.5 degrees C. This happened on average once. So there are very few hot days and in a warm year, six times. But if you jump ahead to one and a half, now you might have, third, have three weeks above 90 degrees. And if you want to talk about the difference between one and a half and three, that's a huge number of days where it's very, very hot. And what this would mean at three degrees C is there'd be no snowpack in a lot of these places. Even if it snowed in the winter, it would go away very quickly in the summer. And so you wouldn't carry over that snowpack and irrigation all along here would be affected. Wow. And so part of what you're hearing here is Sacramento has sort of local issues and regional issues and systems issues that come from the river shed, the watersheds, the rivers, and the industries that feed it, because Sacramento is a hub for a lot of this agriculture. Got it. And, and so, so you went from drought to heat to snowpack, and you can even look at number of snowy days, and you see how you get a composite picture of the changing climate. Wow. And just to note again, 
this is so fantastic and opened such a door to so much data that never would be accessible to a mortal like myself. So, and, and the people watching here. So thank you. And just to boil down what I think I heard that speech to the person, to the mayor of Sacramento, who cares about the freezing days in the mountains that feed the valley and that and industry and the agriculture that is there. What I think you said was that um, th you found a region where uh, there would be 50 days below zero in the past climate. And then you showed that at 1.5, what's coming in 2030 is it goes down to 38. So you're saying, listen, yeah. your number of days below that are freezing days goes from 50 to 38. Get ready for that. So that's the first part of it is get yeah. ready for it. And the second part we're trying to get at is how much better at the end of the century it would be if we prevent a lot of warming. So that would be the second thing is, is it a good, is it any better if we get a 1.5 future as opposed to three? That's the yeah. second question that That's I right. think that mayor would want to ask you. It does prevention pay off. And so we were at 38, but you were going to show us, yeah, maybe there it is. So it's 24. So you go so, down in the average year from 38 days where it stays below zero, down. below freezing to 24. And in a in a in a cold year, the 95th percentile, you go from 71 to 51. So let's reorient you back to the past. So 51 here is now in a three degrees C world. That's a cold year. At 0. 0.5, that was average. And so what was the average becomes the outlier. Got it. Great. Well, and so what was an extraordinarily warm year or what was an average year becomes extraordinary and what was extraordinary becomes uh, uh, average in one direction and in the other direction, it's unprecedented. And so I think that this is the, the so there are some questions in the Q&A, one of which is, can you do this? So the, does this go everywhere in the world? The answer is yes. You can do this, the same thing for almost everywhere in the world. The exception are small islands, uh, island archipelagos in the center of the oceans, the center of the oceans. We don't have this downscaled climate modeling work, but pretty much everywhere else. Another question is about the difference between the global north and the tropics. And what I would say about this is that, and, and the, the Ashwani asks, I've not tried your PF interface, but know the tropics will get hit way worse than the temperate zones. What I would say is that they that many tropical areas are closer to human thresholds than, uh, and, and thus are much more dangerous for human health. What's interesting about the tropics is that tropical weather is much more consistent. In fact, I'll go take show you, uh, take a look at that. And so the changes are less about the tails and more about the means moving, more about the averages. Whereas in the uh, away from the tropics, in the temperate areas, there can be wild extremes. And so which is harder or more challenging for a different uh, given civilization is a, an, an interesting and important question. But if we take increasing heat, um, average temperature, or the 10 hottest days, we'll take the 10 hottest days as a variable and pick a place in the tropics. So I'll pick a place in, you I'll do, pick Hyderabad. This is, what is the temperature of the 10 hottest days? The average so you take the 10 hottest days of the year and what's their average temperature? We'll do this in centigrade. But oh. so in a, in, in a hot year, the average temperature of the 10 hottest days was 44 um, centigrade for the American audience. That's 111 Fahrenheit. Oh my gosh. Okay. So we'll do it for Fahrenheit for now. Um, and so in the past, the 10 hottest days were 111 in a warm year, 104 in an average year and 96 in a, in a cooler year. And you go up and you see these change. So these changes are numerically actually smaller than they are in some other parts of the world. But the difference between 105 and 107 is much is very is profound for the human body because we're already it's a hard temperature to live at. So even small changes at very high temperatures and heat and humidities 
is a big difference. And if you go to three degrees C, that difference, so the, you know, remember what the, this is a cooler year, the average is 102. If we go back to 0.5, the average year was like that. There were some years where it wasn't, it never reached 100 degrees. Yeah. And here we're talking about a big change. Now, those big changes are not bigger than some places in the Northern Hemisphere by a lot, but because the thresholds of survivability are closer there, we're, we're wow. at just higher absolute levels, the wow. impacts are really big. Wow. Spencer, Peter, this is so fantastic. Thank you. And I want to ask the group one final question as we put these two tools together and engage our community and some of the creative minds that are out there. You've seen En-ROADS, you've seen probable futures. Uh, sometimes we think there could be a way that they could be integrated, they could be in parallel. Maybe they're just fine as two websites that you might uh, use when you engage other people. But we wanna ask to you, like, should we do more? As you think about this yourself, how could you imagine this being something that would be uh, even more helpful uh, in the world. And so please go to your poll. I asked like four questions here. It's a bit of a, a grab bag. Should we add probable future maps, like three or four of them to En-ROADS? If so, which ones, why, and who might make that um, happen and fund it? Um, yes, the context is helpful. Yes, please. Uh, <laughs> Great. So please go to the poll. We're interested. Drought. Someone thinks let's, without water, there is no life. I don't know. It might make it too complex. I think two separate websites is best. That certainly saves us a lot of development time. Shit. Yes. Could you just insert links from En-ROADS to probable futures? Yes, we could. Uh, need all four. Relate the scenario with possible actions. Yes, of course. Mass climate migration. Uh, Peter Spencer, you guys haven't um, mapped that yet, I'm guessing. Is that right? Migration. No, we've yeah. not mapped. So probably travel, travel futures is a first order tool. That's the way we think about it, which is we help people foresee the weather. And this actually helps answer a bunch of questions which is that we help people foresee the weather. And to one set of questions, how do you deal with skeptics? Actually, skeptics have less pushback if you start talking about local weather changes, especially when you show how much that has already changed. You say, I'm not talking about Mad Max apocalypse. I'm talking about how often it freezes where you live or how often it's above a certain temperature. Yeah. And that helps ground it. But what the implications of that are in each place, we offer this as a tool and then we offer frameworks to think about it. And so that they allow, right, as Scott, Sina, Scott has said, maps allow local in your backyard changes to be seen. And then you have a conversation about your backyard or you have a conversation about your garden or a conversation. And those conversations are less potentially less fraught, but also they force you to pay attention. So one of the interesting things is it forces conversation at local government levels. So this is maybe not as motivating necessarily for. So Drew asked this question, what would you say to a mayor? mayors and governors, city councilors, they need to think about this work and this is useful to them. And so we provide the information and a framework, but we also say to people, you are the only ones who know how to bring it in. This is not a top down telling you what's gonna happen. It's just a framework and a set of previously theoretically available public information that's been made useful and, and resonant so you can deploy it. And then we have conversations with people as they try to figure out what it might yeah. mean for them. So migration is one application, both directions. Places that are thinking, will migrants come to us? Places that are where people are worried about people leaving. So we actually had a very interesting conversation with the city, the local government of a place that I won't name, where they said, we need your help because we need local people to start doing adaptation and resilience because we face a lot of challenges. So we need climate literacy in our town, our area, but our area is very much at risk and we don't want people to leave. So we want you to scare them enough to do something, but not so much that they move away. That's the kind of tension we experience, but it's a tension we need to talk about. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Spencer. Thank you, Peter. 
And it is the top of the hour, so I'm just going to wrap this up, but also note that we will stick around to answer more of your questions uh, as long as you have questions. And just the basic journey that you all have been on with us today. And really, can we think of ways to complement these two tools with each other? Find ways to think about mitigation and about dealing with the world that's coming no matter what, and also the benefits of preventing some of the worst case scenarios. That's what these two tools are doing together. And I just wanna pause for a second. You know, we lay this out as a technical tool. They are maps and they are images and graphs. Uh, and as technical economics engineering people, sometimes we can like just gloss over the fact that this matters to real people on the ground and it matters to you and me as we all think about the world that we're in today. So just to name and just to the patience with ourselves as we uh, boldly and bravely look at what is coming, where we're at, and orient ourselves towards preparing and preventing. That's the spirit I hope we can come to it with, with also an empathy for what is really here and the fact that people deal with this today. So here are the tools. It's not gonna be easy to use them and create the world we wanna see. It's not gonna be easy, it's gonna be worth it. Go get them everybody, bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks everybody, it was great. Uh, let's go look. So I invite anybody to open up Spencer and Peter, um, Karen, so let's just tag team some. The biggest pushback I anticipate is where is this information coming from? Who benefits from this interpretation? How do we know it is true? Sorry, I have to answer that for En-ROADS all the time. Yeah, and uh, maybe Ava, if you can go to the YouTube version of our establishing credibility uh, lesson in our Mastering En-ROADS course, it teaches how do you deal with the question, uh, the question we hear it as, and maybe you, Spencer and Peter, hear it as, uh, where did you get your data? And when they say, where did you get your data? They don't mean, where did you get your data? What they mean is, I am appropriately skeptical of your biases and orientation. Uh, prove to me that you didn't cook the books to make your political point. And we have a whole lesson. There's a lot that we do with that. A lot of it for us has to do with transparency and good science. Uh, it's a little harder, I think, for us because we have a model. Like we're sharing results from a model where we wrote every equation. Uh, you all, well, you answer. How do you answer that one? What's your guidance to, to Karen on this one? So yeah. I'm going to give my personal answer, and then Peter, Peter, maybe you give our our team answer, or the, the tool answer. So for me, I actually came from a background in other disciplines and actually spent quite a lot of time. So I was first an engineer, and then I worked in economic development, and I have a PhD in economics, and I wound up working in finance. And in fi while working in finance, I discovered climate models and started exploring them. And what I discovered was climate models had already been very pre predictive. They had done well. So the, the earliest um, climate testimony in the United States happened in the 1980s. A guy named George Woodwell and another man named James Hansen testified. And Woodwell's testimony is amazing because he just lists, here are the things that are going to happen in the future about rainfall, about heat, about ice. And all of those forecasts have been accurate. So you have models that have both statistically and narratively been really predictive. And it's not about the aggregate global system, but actually it's pieces. And so the second thing I say is, so I, I started working on this because the models for climate science were better than the models in finance. They were predictive. And then bringing them into real world decision-making was a, a good idea and useful and was one of the goals. Right. So that's one part of it. And then the second part of it is that these tools, these models were not 
that's not one model. These were made by people all around the world, different research institutions all around the world made independent models. And we take a synthesis or we take a, actually a summation, we, we aggregate a group of models to produce these results. And one of the most amazing things is that over the last 40 years, the best, pre, the most predictive model has been a combination of models. And so that's why we bring together a combination of models. There isn't just one view here. There are different views represented by different institutions brought together to give these distributions. And so what we're doing is making public information that's not our data, but is the world's data. And what it shows has already been predictive. So maybe Peter, you wanna talk a little bit about how we get our data and uh, and, and other things that might, might uh, help illuminate that. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, we get our data, um, we inherit it from the global community of people who have been producing climate models around the world um, for many decades. And we inherit it from a group of people named, um, who do a modeling effort called Cordex Core. Um, we use their models in our work. And so you can actually go to our website and you can read all about this. I'll share my screen briefly and show you where you can learn all about this in depth. This is, if you start on the homepage, probablefutures.org, and you go to the science page here in the index, you can learn about climate models in general. We have FAQs here about what climate models do because we do inherit from this global climate model community. Um, and you can look at our maps and you can see where the data for probable futures actually comes from. Get really in depth here. Great. Uh, do either of you see a question in the Q&A that you want to pick up? You'd... Yeah, so I think one of the question, um, yeah, so one of them is, or was a question from Polly Estabrook about do we have wet bulb temperature maps? Yes, we have the, at the same resolution, we have wet bulb temperature maps. Um, and then there's a group of questions that are yeah. here about the impact on, yeah. The tipping right points through. and stuff. I'm yeah. seeing a bunch of breaking points, tipping points, and the AMOC, the right. ocean circulation. And um, so it's, this is one of the things on our to-do list. We're actually looking for the funding yep. to add the, uh, a diagram on this. And I just pulled it up because it's kind of cool. Uh, the folks who are here, maybe you can comment whether you like it. But when, when I saw this, uh, yep. in this image, shoot, did this come from, well, somewhere in the media, a really cool diagram of the temperature at which we hit various tipping points. And you can see Greenland ice sheet collapse, West Antarctic ice sheet collapse. Is it at zero? Is it at 1.5? Is it two degrees, four, six? And the red dot is the central estimate with the max and the min. And I want to find the AMOC, which is the ocean circulation one. It's Atlantic in, current it's collapse, in, fifth from the bottom, Atlantic fifth, current collapse. Atlantic current. So there it is, four degrees is the central estimate. And this is the way that, uh, well, Atlantic currents move. This is one of the things that creates uh, the warming in the, like, the UK, et cetera, uh, and but there's a lot of uncertainty about when and what temperature it happens. The min is down here below two degrees. The max is way up at eight. So we're thinking of maybe adding this in some way to the model and others such as the tropical coral reef die off. Wouldn't it be cool if this was a diagram with a limited number of, uh, of these tipping points and uh, explore how close are we getting to them? So that's a little bit of what we're imagining yep. in the future. If we can find the resources to build it. And I think those are, uh, to tie these together, so Probable Futures takes though, doesn't have a view about those things. What Probable Futures does is says, if you got to certain levels of aggregate warming, what would the weather be? And some of those tipping points have global in impacts. So the tipping points of permafrost uh, uh, thawing that would create you know, runaway uh, emissions or other forms of uh, sea ice changes, things like that can have changes in albedo 
and reflectivity. Problem futures doesn't say whether acceleration or deceleration will happen in warming. It says if we get these different levels of warming. But you asked about AMOC. It is the case that our, the models, the underlying models we use have some degree and they have a different, in, in the way that Drew described this range of opinion effectively, this range of opinions is expressed by some of the models. So some of them have more warming or more slowing of the AMOC and some of them have less. And so there's this diversity. One of the things that means, which I think is the right way to think about it at the present time, is when you look in some places, the range of outcomes in at three degrees C, for example, gets really wide because there might be a different regime and there might not be a different regime. And so what you see is that in some places, in Europe in particular, you wind up still with a lot of cold days in the cold scenarios and a lot of potential hot days in the hot scenarios. And what it means is the future gets harder to plan for. So Drew was asking about, you know, what do you tell a person in a position of power about the difference between one and a half and three? In some places, you can say one and a half degrees is this much cooler than three degrees. What you can say in Europe in particular is between one and a half and three degrees is at one and a half, you sort of know what you're dealing with. At three degrees, the range of possible outcomes is so wide that it gets harder and harder and harder to plan. And so what you're dealing with is potentially much wider tails. And I think that's a, an important way to be able to think about oh, things. Cool. And so that actually does show up in our data to some extent, which is some parts of the world, as they warm, the estimates get further and further apart. And that is useful for decision makers. It's motivating to say, oh my God, it's gonna, it, it could be very different on either side. Mm. Thank you. A couple others I'm picking up. Adam Soul, can you model what would happen if capitalism stopped? The short answer is no. Our model doesn't tackle that one. And uh, it doesn't. And others... Any future scenario predicted by machine learning techniques? En-ROADS does not employ machine learning techniques yet. Uh, there are some folks that we're talking to who want to look at the general circulation models aided by machine learning, and our model might help that in some way, but not yet, not yet. Uh, any others that you see here? Yeah, two things I would say. One is the Pamela Beckett asks about, can probable futures produce a summary for a location or region? And also, could it be overlaid with population? So we, on the public platform that we're sharing with you here, you can't do that exactly. But uh, we've built a tool. Actually, Peter is really in charge of it. And it's called Probable Futures Professional or Probable Futures Pro. You can then import data onto those very easily. In fact, we have a library already of data you can use, which includes population data. So you can put population on our maps. You can make take other maps and, and, and incorporate our data, but you can put onto probable futures maps all kinds of other things, including population, the location of power plants, the location of farms around the world, the location of different kinds of, li of wildlife, Anything that has spatial data, you can put on our maps with a tool that we're, we're also happy to share. Um, uh, and Peter's going to share with you here. So just a quick demo of what Spencer's talking about. This is Probable Futures Pro. If you come here and you log in um, and you can request access to this, I will drop a link in the chat about where to access that. Um, you can go and you can use some of the example data that Spencer talked about. So we have brought in some open source data sets that we've found around the world that we think would be interesting to look at together with climate data, airports, world cities, UNESCO World Heritage Sites, and power plants, some of the open source data that we found. You can also upload your own data. So anything you find online or any data that you have places that you care about, you can upload that and bring it in. And this is what it looks like when you have it in there. So you can see this is world cities, and this is showing all these world cities in this in this data set. And now you can say, where are there world cities that will experience conditions like days above 32 or any of the other conditions in our map? And you can filter it that way and see how it changes with different warming scenarios. And you can cool. make the dot 
it's bigger or smaller or color them, but you can sort through them and filter them. Minta is asking, what about adding tipping points for fauna and flora species survival? So how we think about that uh, is, is less the language of tipping points and more um, the approach of, uh, well, just an indicator that we added, which is around biodiversity and flora and fauna. If you go here to impacts and then species losing more than 50% of climatic range. Click on the little triangle and you can see this is a study in science, Warren et al, 2018. And then can see under the baseline, uh, what species, well, uh, which species losing more than 50% of the climatic range, invertebrates 50% of the species losing more than half their range, plants 45, mammals 24, just some heartbreaking numbers about the future, but also today, mammals have already lost 2%. That's what this uh, line is right here. And what if carbon pricing and energy efficiency, et cetera? And it's interesting, this is one of the measures that is particularly sensitive to the difference between two degrees and 1.5. This came out of the study, the special report from the IPCC about the distinction between 2.2 degrees and 1.5. And those studies were some of the ones that led the uh, whole UNFCCC, which is the group that pulls together the negotiations to push for an explicit mention of the goal of 1.5, as opposed to just well below two, because look at where insects are at 21%. But if you can get down to 1.5, then it drops uh, really precipitously, non-linearly. Uh, it's much better to get to 1.5 than two. This is how we think of flora and fauna. Thank you for that question. And actually the way we think about flora and fauna is that our tools can be used by, in fact, there was a question earlier about planting trees that looking ahead at the likely climate is a good way to decide what trees to plant. We already know some oh. people are using probable futures to say, all right, we manage a forest. Should we be planting the same kinds of trees that have been in the forest in the past, or should we be transitioning what we plant? And the same is true in agriculture, but it can be used by people in virology and other, uh, and to think about the spread of infectious diseases. But those experts know what the thresholds are or what the indicators are. And so one of the things that's helpful for us is if people tell us, you know, what would be helpful is a map of this outcome, because this outcome is really important for X, Y, and Z. So we have lots of maps that are around human health. That's why we use these temperatures, because all of us have the same body temperature. So a lot of our temperature scenarios are around human health, but there are other kinds of thresholds that we that we could um, could make maps of if we knew that those were valuable. So 90 degrees Fahrenheit actually is ideal for wheat. And above 90 degrees, it starts to really de deteriorate. Up to 90, it gets more and more productive. And after, so 90 is chosen partly for some main crops. But that's the way we interact with those questions. Fantastic. The last question, Ashwani is asking either of you, do you offer presentations or trainings on using your models? Yes, all the time we do trainings. Uh, yes, that is something we actively do. And if you're interested in reaching out, um, please reach out on probablefutures.org. Hello at probablefutures.org. Great. Well, I think we should wrap this up. Spencer, Glenn, and Peter, and thanks to the team, Ava, Yazzie, Janet, Ellie, Chris, you were here. Some of you helped answer the other questions. Um, and just excited about this possibility of pulling these approaches together. Thank you, Spencer and Peter. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Thanks to all the En-ROADS folks for hosting us, Climate Interactive folks for hosting us, and for everybody staying on the chat. We still got yeah, 82 Look at all these people writing in the Amazing. chat still. People are still there. We got 82 people still. Uh, Someone 30. wrote, awesome. Thank you. I say awesome. Thank you back at you. Okay. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.